Oh, you know, I love those people, those who led us in worship today, and uh, our amazing principal, Joel. And as I think about the wonderful things in my life, I realize that the familiar is what I love most. Now, there might be a whole other world out there of things that I have not yet encountered, and I don't love those things, at least not yet. And I don't know about you, but I've also noticed a tendency within myself when I encounter something new to resist it. Anyone else? Not at all? All right. Yeah. Now, it's true that uh, maybe, just maybe, you're one of those people that really, really likes change. But even if you love change, there are a few new things that are just too new for you, aren't there? When I was a kid, we used to make uh, trips frequently across the mountains. We lived up there in uh, Tumwater or Auburn area, depending on what uh, phase of life. But I remember we would make these trips in this pickup truck, a 69 GMC pickup, across the mountains to visit my dad's side of the family and to gather produce. We would fill the back of that truck up with a whole bunch of apples all the way piled up as high as you could pile them. Sometimes it would be potatoes, sometimes it would be a mix of all kinds of things, melons and grapes and whatever else we could get our hands on. It was a, it was a grand tradition to go and gather the produce from the east side of the mountains and to visit my dad's family at the same time. But there was one thing that I hated about it. Well, maybe there were a few things I hated about it, but one thing that came to symbolize everything that I hated about this. It was sagebrush. There's no excuse for sagebrush. I remember clearly the first time that I encountered sagebrush, we were on one of those trips all five of us in my family piled into the cab of that truck. This was before the laws prevented that kind of thing. And there was no air conditioning in the truck. And so as we got over the mountains and we began to uh, get down to, you know, closer to sea level, and we encountered the dry, hot air of eastern Washington, we began to sweat. My brothers began to stink. And then on the landscape, we saw these little tufts of something. What's that, Mom? That's sagebrush. Ew. And so the sagebrush came to symbolize all that I didn't like about this new experience. The sweating in the cab of the truck, the, the soreness from sitting too long, the awkward situations uh, visiting with relatives I didn't know very well, and I was supposed to talk to them and give them hugs and, you know, all that stuff. And it symbolized that. And so I, I came up with this phrase over time, there's just no excuse for sagebrush. It's wrong. I mean, you're going to do that landscape. You cross over the mountains and all of these beautiful cedar trees and, and the green grass is going to be exchanged for that? I mean, that's, it hardly knows how to be green. Come on. And so I hated sagebrush. And so... As I was off in Pennsylvania, enjoying, enjoying a very green landscape out there, a little hot and humid, true, but it was at least green, hilly. They called them mountains. I don't know what that was about, but, you know, I guess it works for them. And I sensed that it was time to move back west to western Washington to my home or somewhere thereabouts to be close to family. And so I sent out my resume. I sent it out to Western Washington, I sent it out to Western Oregon, several places, but definitely no place with sagebrush. And one day, I'm minding my own business, standing in a very green backyard with green trees all around me and beautiful flowers everywhere, and I get a phone call, I answer my flip phone, and it's some guy from Idaho saying, we've got a church here who needs a pastor. Are you interested? Uh, no. I've been to Boise, Idaho. There's sagebrush. What are you kidding me? So we moved to Idaho. 
And for the first year, I maintained my party line internally and externally. There's no excuse for sagebrush. Lived there for nearly four years. And the odd thing is now I look back on the memories of that place and that sagebrush and I think of things like this. My beautiful daughter picking what few flowers grew by the sagebrush. The stench of the stuff from picking it. Now I wistfully think about the smell of sagebrush. You see, often the things that we resist because they are new, they're different, they're uncomfortably different, are the things that we come to love if we allow ourselves to experience them. The lesson of the sagebrush. Jesus talked about change. And the experience of new and different things in John chapter 9. Not John, Matthew chapter 9. John 9 is about a blind man. It's a good story too, but John, uh, Matthew chapter 9. And I want to lay a principle on you before we go to the text, and then we can test it against the text. But the principle is this. Growth is change. You think about it. If you have a child and the child ceases to grow, it stays the same size, right? Nothing changes. They don't learn anything. You'd say they're not growing, right? If, if you see changes in them, you say the child's growing. Same with the tree. The tree stays the same, never gets thicker, never gets taller. Well, it's, it's not growing. But if it changes, it's growing. You see what I mean? And I think this is true in our spiritual experiences, whether it's collectively as churches and communities, whether we experience things that are new as a positive or a negative, I would suggest that if there's no new thing, there is no growth. Growth is change. Well, you might or might not believe me, but I'll, I'll take you to Jesus' words and try to convince you. Okay. <laughs> no, I think we all understand on some level that this principle is true. But what I would like to do is go to jo uh, Matthew, it is Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, and look at what Jesus said about change and extract some principles that can help to guide us as we encounter change. Is that okay? All right, I think that's useful because there's plenty of change. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9 has a series of encounters. Jesus encountering different groups of people. It starts with the scribes. Matthew 9, verse 1. There's some crazy and exciting things that have just happened as we lead up to this moment. Jesus has just healed a leper. And in the act of healing that leper, he had done something extremely new for a teacher of righteousness. It says in the text, he touched the leper. And that was what you weren't supposed to do because the concept was that you would get leprosy by touching a leper. He touched the leper to heal him. We also had a centurion, a man who was not on the side of Israel. He was part of the occupying force and, and Jesus helped this man too, a very new thing. Jesus was healing people left and right, and this was messing with the theology of those who were in, in authority and were teaching Scripture because they taught very clearly that if you were suffering some sickness, it meant that you had sinned and God was punishing you. And so this man comes along and just takes away all the punishments. What does that do to your theology? And so he is messing with their minds. He is doing some new things, and we get to chapter 9, and it says this. Verse 1, and getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city, Nazareth. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. One of these cases of those who was judged to be judged by God. Obviously, the man had sinned, and maybe he had. But they had a pretty tight system and didn't account for suffering being an act of Satan and not always an act of God. And when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of those who brought the man to him, he said to the paralytic, take heart, 
my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Notice the question that the scribes are asking about Jesus. What is their question? How does he have authority to forgive sins, right? As far as we can tell, this is a normal man. And if they had studied the Old Testament, they were probably right. But there was one thing they were missing in the situation. And what was that? This was, in fact, God. God in human form, but God. This was Jesus. He was God. And so the thing that the scribes didn't understand with this new experience of a man who claimed to forgive sins is that this man was God and he was in charge. That's what they missed. And so the reason Jesus did something new in this case, and I want us to catch this principle, is that he was in charge. He was sovereign. He did something new because he was, is sovereign. Now, I think as we encounter potential changes in our lives, in our church, in our community, whatever it might be, I think one of the starting principles we must keep in mind is that God is sovereign and can change things. Is that okay? Okay. Would it be okay for us to put God in charge of our lives and say, God, you can change anything you want? I think so. So principle number one in this interaction with the scribes is Jesus is sovereign. And this spoke to the scribes particularly. The scribes, that's a tradition, a group of people that in ancient Israel, before Rome came in and took over Palestine, they had actually been kind of secretaries of state they were in political authority, okay, in governmental authority. They studied the law, and um, they administered the law, and so they were used to the idea in their tradition that they were kind of the final word. They were in charge. And Jesus says, no, no. (laughs) I'm sovereign here. Encounter number two, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were also an interesting group of people who had a great deal of influence at the time. And the Pharisees were not all the same. There were several different uh, groupings of Pharisees with different perspectives. But all in all, these were the folks who were serious about applying God's word. So serious, in fact, that they had built up a whole list of extra rules by which they could make sure that they were going to keep God's word precisely. Over time, sadly, those extra rules had begun to get in the way of God's word itself. That's what happens. Whenever we make a dynamic connection with God into a system of rules only, it gets in the way of that connection. Whenever we take the grand principles of the Christian faith and what God's trying to do through the salvation process and we turn it into a system of rules only, we end up violating the principles in time. And that's what the Pharisees had done. But they meant well. They did. And so here we encounter the Pharisees and they have a question not about who's in charge. They have a question about proper theology, proper doctrine. What is this teacher, Jesus, communicating by his behavior? He seems to be communicating a message that's out of sync with Scripture, they say. And here it is, uh, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said, follow me. 
And he arose and followed him. Now, a tax collector, this was uh, Matthew, was becoming one of Jesus' disciples at this moment. But a tax collector was not somebody that was very loved by the Jews. The reason for that was because he was working for the Romans, who had come in and conquered their land. He was a traitor. And so, of all the sinners on the list of bad sinners, tax collector was somewhere near the top. And so Jesus had the audacity to reach into this man's world with all of his sinfulness and all of his traitorliness and make him one of his disciples. It's already a scandal. But it gets worse as far as they're concerned. And verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors... More of the bad guys. And sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. You have to understand something about the historical setting of this kind of thing. In the ancient Near East, and even today in the Middle East, if you eat with somebody, it's a very intimate thing. It is an endorsement of them as a person. It is appreciating them. It is seeing that you two are one in a sense. And so for Jesus to eat with sinners was saying something that they weren't ready to hear. That these sinners are somehow okay? Never. Is Jesus a sinner? Oh, he must be. He just allied himself with these folks. So they're scandalized. It's just too much for them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, but when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And then he quotes a Bible text from Hosea, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy, not sacrifice. The sacrifice here I'm going to suggest to you is, is kind of a symbol of the system of rituals. And the system of rituals had come to replace the real purpose of God's love. And so he says, it's not about the system, folks. It was always about the principle of, of God's love, of mercy. And ironically and tragically, these Pharisees had come to the place where they were violating the principle with the rules that they had established in order to serve it. Wow. And so Jesus calls them out and says, look at the Bible. Go and learn what this one means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so point number two in dealing with change, the first one was that God is in charge. God is sovereign. And we need to let him be sovereign in the changes that happen in our lives. As long as he's guiding it, it's safe. Principle number two is that we need to follow principle over a system. Jesus did something new in this case, something scandalously new to serve principle. That's why he did it. And the principle was God's unfailing love. That word mercy in the Hebrew, if you go back to the original text, is chesed, which we've talked about a few weeks ago. And it's this term that keeps coming up again and again in God's interaction with his people. And this is what he's about. It's called, it's best defined as a steadfast love, an unfailing love. That's what we're about. That's the principle that he appealed to. So principle over practice. And then there's a third interaction. It's John's disciples. Now, John the Baptist was a crazy-eyed prophet. He was uh, born about six months before Jesus. There was an angel that met his father in the temple and really scared him to death <laughs> to tell him that this man would come and prepare the way for the Christ. And so John the Baptist had been an amazing revivalist. He was down at the Jordan River. He was living in the desert, eating locusts and wild honey. Wow, crazy guy. And and he had come in preaching God's word, and the message he preached, does anyone remember what his message was? 
repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. And so many had repented. They had set aside their wayward uh, practices, and they had started to become very devout and, and spiritually deep. And this was beautiful. This was a movement of God, and, and it's described as a movement of the Spirit. And so these people, John's disciples, had had real revival. And that real revival had led to some religious practices like fasting and prayer. And so Jesus comes along, and he does something different. He's feasting. He's not fasting. How is that? How is it possible for some to have this deep religious experience in this particular way, and then someone else comes along, and, and they're doing it differently? Does that mean they're not spiritual too? Well, that's the concern they had. We know what real spirituality looks like, John's disciples are saying to themselves, and, and we know what that is. We've experienced it. It was profound. The Spirit was there. We saw it. We sensed it. And you're doing it different? Well, I imagine that's not a question that any of you have found yourself asking at any point in your Christian experience, right? No, of course not. <laughs> but that's what they asked. Here it is. John's disciples, verses 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but, but, but you and your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Notice the nature of his answer. His answer is about situation. That practice might change given a situation. Interesting. Interesting. Now, this is not equivalent in my mind to situation ethics where there's no principle necessarily behind it. Now, I think he's still appealing to principle, but he's saying the practice may be a little different for you and for me, depending on the situation. That's exactly what he says. Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests, here's the situation, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast. And then he gives some illustrations of the concept. He talks about the old and the new. First, he describes cloth. Is anyone here a, a sew? Okay. Now, what do you do with your fabric before you sew it all together? You wash it, especially certain types of fabric that tend to shrink. Right? And so he appeals to that illustration. The people in that day had to do a lot of sewing at home, and so it was a familiar thing. And so he says, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and worse tear is made. All right? So that's kind of a static thing. He says, you put these two together over time, They'll pull away from each other, so it won't work. You can't mix the old and the new. Interesting. Then verse 17. Jesus appeals to a much more explosive image, to winemaking. And this was a fairly common practice in the time, so the crowds around him, when he says, hey, let's talk about wineskins and winemaking, they're all like, oh yeah, we know how to do that. He says, neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins. And so both are preserved. So the practice here was uh, pretty basic. They would go out and kill a goat and skin it. And in a fairly fresh goat skin, there was some elasticity. You could stretch it, right? And they would take and press the grapes, and they would put the juice of the grapes in that goat skin, and they would seal it together, and that grape juice would begin to ferment and turn into fermented wine. And that goat skin was elastic enough that it could stretch. Now, I don't know if the practice was to occasionally release the, the pressure or what was going on there, but whatever the case, it needed to stretch some for this to work out. And if they happen to take an old skin that had already stretched to the max, and they put juice in there, and they seal it up, there's no elasticity. And some, somewhere in the middle of the night, 
as they're trying to rest, across the room from the table where they've set this goat skin, suddenly they get a shower. <laughs> I actually went on Google and I Googled some of the uh, home brewing uh, forums, so don't look at my web history. Um, and, and many different stories of this kind of thing happening, where you know you seal it in a bottle and suddenly in the middle of the night you hear this <laughs> and it's throwing glass all over the place. So Jesus is appealing to this picture. He says, you don't do that, do you? You don't put the, the new stuff in the old. Well, it's the same way with this religious practice that we're talking about, fasting. Fasting was good for you in the moment, in the situation. But right now, the situation is we're celebrating the bridegroom's presence. And so you need to experience this differently. That's his argument. The principle is that he does something new because growth is often change. Growth is often change. And to me, these three principles come together and they paint a picture that in dealing with change in our spiritual experience, there are three things at least that we need to make sure of. Number one, and this one can't be forgotten, God must be in charge of the change. New is not bad, but new, unguided by God, can be dangerous. So what does God's word say? What does he tell you when you pray? It must be guided by God. Number two, in order to be guided by God, I believe that we need to sometimes set aside the structures of expectations that we've set for ourselves, the practices, and ask ourselves, what is the principle behind this? What was God trying to accomplish through whatever it was, through worship, through um, his laws? What was he trying to accomplish? What was the principle behind that? Let's make sure that in the end, we don't end up like the Pharisees, but we continue to honor the principles. Number two. And number three, Jesus is saying, Growth is change. The situation calls for different things at different times. At least that's the spin I, I put on that. That's the way I understand it. But he's certainly calling for differences at different times, situation. But if we're guided by God, and if we make sure we're honoring the principles we know to be true, then the changes given in our situation can be safe, I think. You all seem pretty quiet. I hope you're thinking. It's good. It's good. Well, going back to my childhood, and I think about the changes in my own spiritual journey. Early on, as I look back, I realized that my spiritual experience was very much, earliest in the earliest experience, it was very much about being good knowing the things that I was supposed to do and making sure that I was doing all the right things. And that's not bad, but that was the sum total of my experience. Be good. If you're good, Jesus is happy. If you're good, you get to go to heaven. I'm going to be good. And so I can recall being very careful about being good and making sure that when I wasn't good, I had confessed every single sin. And so as a little boy, I would lie awake at night thinking, okay, what did I do wrong today that I haven't said I'm sorry for? And again, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible calls us to confess our sins. But that was the center of my experience, being good enough. The next phase of my experience, as I look back, was about being right. Right. I started to study scripture and, and there was this sense that, you know, we've got to pursue the truth. And I still believe that. But it became the center of my experience. Less focus on being good, now focused on being right. And boy, I had some wonderful arguments with people about the Bible. And I'm sure that I didn't convince anyone. And the sad and painful thing about that is I remember I had discovered... In, I had come to the conclusion in the Bible that God was really against women wearing jewelry. 
And since, as I've studied that, I don't think that God cares deeply about jewelry, but I did then. And I was in college, and I, I see the picture in my mind. I still feel bad, and I don't even know her name, but I was there in a group of friends, and the topic came up. I don't recall whether I brought it up or someone else, and, and I argued vehemently that this was wrong, and it was a matter of being right. I had to be right. They had to be right. And I remember seeing this girl who was probably just trying to find her way in college begin to wither here. She looked great. But I was condemning her because it was about being right. It wasn't about being loving. The next phase of my experience in my journey was about working for God. So we go from being good enough to being right enough to working hard enough. And so when I graduated college and I was given an opportunity to go to western Washington, back home, and pastor two churches, which is quite a lot of responsibility. And I was given another opportunity to go to Minnesota and actually go to school some more. All right, that's pretty easy. Instead, I took the third option, and that was they wanted to give me six churches in northwest Pennsylvania. So it's about working for God. It sounded like a lot of work. It was exciting. God will be happy with me. No. You know, in the end, God doesn't love me more. It's not good. The tech people don't love me, but God does. You might need to advance my slides for me. But in, the, but in the end, and I say in the end, it's not, that's not the proper terminology. My current phase of development, and God probably has something far beyond this too. My current phase in my journey is not so much that God wants me to be good. He wants that too. Not that he wants me to be right. He wants that too. Not that he wants me to work hard for him. Yeah, he wants that too. But my current experience in the journey is that God wants me. And that's better. And whatever he wants to do to build on that, I'm okay with it because change, change is growth. Change is growth. Thanks. Was that subtle? Oh, they're good to me back there. And so as we look at things like doing Christian life together in a church body, whether you're part of this church body or part of another one somewhere else, I think it's important for us to understand these principles. Those principles of... What were the principles? God is sovereign. We follow principle over practice, yep. And growth is, is change, yeah. I think we need to keep these things in mind. You know, as you look at, there it is, they're good. Let God lead the change. Let God lead the change, and it's good growth. It's good growth. But as we look at doing church together, doing community together, I think it would be wrong of me not to bring this up. Because as you look at church growth throughout history and probably your past experience, it seems that whenever there is growth, whenever there is progress, there is change. And whenever there is change, there is resistance to that change. And whatever change resistance there is tends to become a fight, and that's not beautiful. <laughs> it's not what God wants for us. And I'm not specifically calling out anything here, so if you're kind of visiting today and you're wondering, what's going on in the church? No, it's not that. It's a principle that we need to be reminded of from time to time. You know, one of those things that always comes up is, is music, right? No? In fact, it's the one that comes up the most. The most. Yes, it does. And I wonder if God wants to grow us through each other's preferences in music. Is that possible? If growth is changed, is it possible that God wants me to sit here and enjoy how great thou art and grow through that 
because that's not my native language. But he wants to stretch me there. And is it possible that he wants you to, to grow through Start a Fire? Or one of these other songs, you don't even know the title of that, do you? No. <laughs> is it possible that he wants us to learn each other's language and be stretched? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As long as God is leading it, right? As long as God is in charge, as long as we're going back to principle, as long as we remember that growth is change and God wants to lead change in our lives, well, there's a good future. There's a good future for this community. There's a good future for your personal spiritual journey, wherever that takes you. Let God lead change in your life. In just a moment, in fact, just about now, the praise team is going to come back up and lead us in a song. And this song is specifically chosen to go along with this message, to be a reminder that God wants to be actively present in our experience. It says, the same power that rose or raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. As long as this community is the sort of community that wants to be led by the Spirit of God and let God be God, I want to be part of it. But if we ever forget that, we've really lost everything. A direct leading from God. And so let's sing together, or if you don't know the song, I just told you you have to appreciate it, didn't I? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But if you don't know the song, just reflect on the words. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Let's sing together. his promises are true in his strength there is nothing we can do yes we know there are greater things in store we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose Jesus from the Yeah. 
one of those things is that you don't just rule from heaven, but you are here on earth with us and in us. And I pray that we accept, uh, we accept the power of yours in our lives um, to know that we can make a difference in the things that we're battling against, the things that we're struggling with, and the challenges that we feel called to fight. Uh, I just pray that, um, that you speak through us and we trust in you and your power leading in our lives. Amen.